Thank you very much. Um, progress and prospects, I, you know, looking at that title, which was suggested by somebody else, I have to say the idea of progress implies that, well, we've we found six civilizations last week, and the week before we only found five, uh, neither of which is true. But there has been progress. I'll try and tell you why I remain very sanguine, very optimistic about our chances of finding ET within your lifetimes and uh, what we're doing in the field. And also some speculation. There's always speculation in the field of SETI. Some speculations on what ET might be like and how that might affect our search. Um, let me dispense with this. People often ask me at parties, uh, other than asking me to get away from the hors d'oeuvres, they will ask me questions like, do you really think they're out there? And the answer that I give to that is not surprising. Now, yes, I think they're out there. And the reason is, the bottom line, is only this. This is one of the Hubble Deep Field photos. Many of you know that. Uh, you can see many galaxies here. But the bottom line is, if you were to take photos like this all across the sky, you'd count about 100 billion galaxies. That means the number of stars within our purview is like 10 to the 22. Now, we don't know how many of those stars have planets, but the people who search for planets, people like Jeff Marcy in California, have enough statistics that they can sort of estimate how many planets they're not finding. So if you ask Jeff Marcy, say, Jeff, if you had perfect instruments, what fraction of stars do you think would have planets? His answer would be mm, maybe 50%, maybe 75%. So to an astronomer, 50% is the same as all. And since planets usually come in, it seems, come in groups, they're usually more than one, at least judging from our own solar system and a few others, uh, this means that the number of planets in the universe, the visible universe, is probably 10 times this number. So the reason that we think they're out there is simply this. If you don't, then you believe in miracles. It isn't unusual to say, I think that they're out there. What is unusual is to say, no, I don't think they're out there, because that means in a visible cosmos of 10 to the 23 planets, you figure this is the only interesting one, and you believe in miracles. And ever since Copernicus, it turns out it's been bad, a bad idea to believe in miracles. OK. Uh, I said there are like 10 to the 23 planets. We don't know what fraction of those are livable planets, habitable planets. We haven't found any planets, by the way, so far that are deemed to be habitable by our standards. Uh, however, that's going to change in the next 700 days. I think most of you are well aware of the Kepler spacecraft, the NASA spacecraft to look for Earth-sized worlds in the so-called habitable zone. And nobody knows how many it's going to find, if any. But the smart money, which is to say the people over at NASA Ames Research Center who are doing the experiment, uh, figure that they'll find 30 to 50 Earths. Okay. Now, if that's right, in a field of 150,000 stars, only a fraction of a percent of which will be oriented the right way to allow them to find those planets, if you do those numbers, then if their expectation pans out, that means that in our galaxy, they're on the order of somewhere between 100 million and a billion Earth-like planets. Okay, so that's still a pretty big number just in our galaxy. Okay, the other thing that uh, encourages people in this field, and this was mentioned earlier in the SETI sessions today, this is a photo I made in the Northwest Australia, the so-called Pilbara Hills, and uh, these hills are really as old as any hills get. These hills are known to be about three and a half billion years old, and you see the, the mounds in the middle there, they look like petrified cantaloupes, but in fact, are uh, the remains of bacterial colonies that lived three and a half billion years ago. In other words, three and a half billion years ago, there was already a widespread life on the Earth, and the Earth being only four and a half billion years old to begin with, suggests a point that's been made for quite some time, that life must not be terribly improbable a development because it didn't take very long here on Earth to happen. Uh, the counter argument, of course, is that this is a sample of one. And that's true. But it could, have, it could have taken billions of years for life to develop on Earth, and it clearly didn't. OK, there's also the question of just because there's a lot of life, how much of it will be intelligent? We don't know the answer to that. And that's perhaps the most controversial subject in the field of SETI. If I were to give you a million worlds with life and just let them sit there and do their Darwinian thing, what fraction of them would ultimately cook up something as clever as the guy sitting next to you? We don't know. 
right? And you might say overlooked to it, completely inevitable, because, I mean, we started four billion years ago with microbes, and then, uh, you know, half a billion years ago, we got multicellular things, and, you know, we got trilobites, and we got dinosaurs, and we got you. But that's looking backward. If you look forward, it's never quite so clear. And uh, to point out an obvious uh, example of how this might not have happened, if the asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs and about two-thirds of all other land-dwelling life forms 65 million years ago had arrived 10 hours earlier, it would have missed the Earth and you wouldn't be sitting through this boring lecture. There would be dinosaurs in Prague. Now you might figure that the dinosaurs themselves would have gotten smart. Uh, a suggestion that I made to one of the evolutionary biologists at the American Museum of Natural History uh, uh, many years ago, and his response to that thought was, well, Seth, he said, the dinosaurs had 150 million years to get smart and did not. So what would another 65 million years have done for them? So again, this is somewhat controversial. There are several lines of investigation into the question of just because you have life, will you get intelligent life? Uh, and some of them look at things like this, the, the ideas of looking at the mechanisms that seem to raise the IQ of animals. This is a study, this, this plot's about 10 years old now, but it's still a very instructive one. What she's done here, is, uh, this is Lori Marino's plot, she's at Emory University. She's plotted how clever dolphins and toothed whales have been for the last 60 million years. You may wonder how she knows, and it isn't because she's found the college entrance exams for these creatures, because they didn't take them, but she measures the ratio of their brain size to their body size, which seems to be a fairly good measure of uh, sophisticated behavior in animals. So what you have here in this plot, does this thing work, sort of? Uh, you have time, this is today up here, and this is 50 million years ago down here. And then this is IQ, so stupid, smart, okay? You can see 50 million years ago, the dolphins were pretty dumb. But then they, they developed echolocation, their brains got bigger. It's not clear that that made them smarter, but at least they could use echolocation. And then since then, you can see some of them have gotten dumber again, and some of them have gotten quite smart. In fact, two million years ago, the smartest creature on the earth was a white-flanked dolphin, okay? Now, they didn't leave a lot of literature, so they weren't intelligent in terms of SETI, but on the other hand, the suggestion being made by this kind of research is that at least once you get to a certain level of complexity, there is an evolutionarily attractive niche for intelligence. And that suggests, well, of course it does not prove, but it does suggest that intelligence might not be a miracle itself. That if I give you a million worlds with life and let them cook, for billions of years, some of them will produce intelligence. Okay, so how can we find it? Well, this is the history that everybody knows, but I feel ob obliged to show it. You have Philip Morrison here on the left and uh, Zeppi Cocconi on the right. They were somewhat younger than in these pictures, working at Cornell University in the late 1950s, and Cocconi waltzed into the office of Phil Morrison, and he said, you know, we're working on gamma rays, and gamma rays might actually be a great way to send bits of information from one star system to another. And Phil Morrison thought that that was an interesting idea, but he suggested, why, why limit yourself to gamma rays? Let's look at everything. And the thought experiment that they did was this. They, they settled on radio waves as maybe being more attractive than gamma waves. They're a lot cheaper to produce, for one thing. They said, suppose we take the most powerful radar transmitter we have, and we put it over here, and then we take the biggest antenna, receiving antenna, and put it over here, aimed at the transmitter, and then separate them until the receiver can just barely pick out the transmitter. What is the distance at which that still works? And even in 1959, the distance was light years. In other words, the distance is between stars. So they wrote a paper, and that's what actually started the field of SETI. The idea being, rather than waiting for the, uh, rocket, the rocket engineers to build us a rocket that can take us to the stars, or waiting for the aliens to come here, although one-third of the American public in any case, believes that the aliens are here. That's a different story. Um, rather than doing that, we'll find the aliens in situ by simply eavesdropping on their transmission. So unbeknownst to Cocconi and Morrison, of course, Frank Drake was actually doing an experiment in Green Bank, West Virginia, using this 85-foot diameter antenna, pointing it at two nearby stars and hoping to find signals that would prove that they're out there. Uh, he looked, by the way, at the 21-centimeter line of hydrogen not so much because that's an interesting frequency that every alien will have engraved on their receivers, 
but only because he figured that this way, since that's a useful line for radio astronomy, he wouldn't get any criticism from his colleagues for building equipment that they couldn't use afterward. The whole experiment cost about $2,000. Um, Frank didn't hear anything. Well, actually, he did hear something. There were two memorable phrases that came out of this several month long experiment. The first one was when they switched from one star to another, they, they looked at two, two nearby stars about a dozen light years away, two sun-like stars. When they switched from one star to the next, they suddenly heard this loud whooshing sound every eight seconds, whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. And Frank's comment to his colleagues was, could it be this easy? And his second comment was, what do we do now? Well, what they did now was actually build another antenna so they could find out that this was in fact not ET on the line, this was the US Air Force, which didn't count as extraterrestrial intelligence. All right, enough of the history. Since then, um, SETI has been done mostly as a part-time endeavor. Up until the 1990s, it was exclusively a part-time endeavor. And there have been two general strategies. One listed here is number two, are targeted searches, which are to do exactly the same experiment that Frank Drake had done, which is to point the antenna in the direction of nearby star systems on the assumption that some of them might have a, an inhabited planet. And the other strategy, sky surveys, is to say, look, let's not make any assumptions about where ET might be hanging out. We'll just look at the entire sky. Now, that sounds like a, a better idea because it makes fewer assumptions. But it's not necessarily a better idea because it, it, it has the corollary that you don't spend very long looking at any given spot on the sky. Consequently, your sensitivity is considerably less. It's been likened to trying to find life in the desert. You could just look at the whole desert, or you could just concentrate on the oases where you know there's liquid water. Uh, it's unclear which is the better strategy or whether either of these strategies is the correct one, because until you have success, you can't say. Both strategies are still pursued. I'd like to say that the sky surveys are mostly done in the United States by the University of California Berkeley SETI group, which consists of, this is half the group here, uh, it, it may not be known to you that the total number of people that are doing SETI as a so-called profession, I, I, I say that only in terms of the pay scale, not in terms of the work, the total number of people that are doing SETI as, a, as their day job is about equal to the number of people in any given row in this audience. Actually, it's fewer than that. And it's mostly an American endeavor too, by the way. Uh, the Italians are doing a very clever experiment and there is uh, an experiment being done in South Korea. But other than that, it's an American enterprise. And uh, I would like to suggest to this, which is an international conference after all, that every other country that I've ever dealt with has the equipment, the expertise, and the money to do this. And uh, I would like to see it being done by other countries. I think that the reason it's being done in the US is a mystery to me and could be the PhD thesis for somebody in the social sciences. Uh, Dan Wertheimer here at UC Berkeley has built some very clever spectrometers that can be used for SETI that divvy up the incoming cosmic static into very narrow channels, typically one hertz wide. And he does this with fast Fourier transforms and specialized hardware and so forth. And you can buy the whole thing. It'll fit in your suitcase and it doesn't cost very much money. And uh, you can just buy one of these things and put it on your own antenna and you'll be able to do SETI research yourselves and you might find ET. Their big experiment, by the way, which is uh, some of the data of which is distributed on the internet for the SETI at home screensaver, is done using the Arecibo telescope down in Puerto Rico. And here you see the feed set up for the Arecibo telescope. People that are using the telescope for studying galaxies or pulsars, those are the sorts of things they do at Arecibo, use the antenna arrangement up in there in the Gregorian feed. But just for mechanical considerations, there's a balancing piece of hardware over here on the right, one of these old linear feeds. And that's the one that the Berkeley guys use, because nobody else is using it, right? So they just take the signals coming in there and then analyze those. Now, that sounds like a good deal. They get to use the world's biggest antenna, but the problem is that while these guys get to choose where in the sky they're gonna look, these guys do not, right? So they're just looking at random spots on the sky. So, you know, their beam is sweeping across the sky. Yeah, they get about a one and a half seconds at any given point, but it is a very big antenna. This is the SETI at home screensaver. Any of you guys run that? Anybody here? Yeah. Yeah, there have been, uh, I think at last count, 8 million downloads of the SETI at home screensaver. My own organization, the SETI Institute, has been um, more inclined to do targeted searches, where you can sort of zero in on a particular star system or other target 
and observe not just for one and a half seconds, but observe for a few hundred seconds, a few minutes in other words. And that will give you much more sensitivity. And also, it gives you the advantage that if you find something, right, you can track it down right away. You can do follow-up observations right away. And so you're not left with a whole bunch of signals that look sort of interesting. Right? You don't go home with a drawer full of, I wonder what this is. Okay, so that's the advantage of the targeted searches. The biggest project that we did was called Project Phoenix. It began in Australia in 1995 using the Parkes telescope seen here with some star in the background. And it, it covered a fairly wide range of frequencies. Uh, we had one hertz channels. We had literally billions of channels covering each star system. We had to stage this spectrometer. We couldn't do it all at once. We typically had 56 million channels at any given go. Anyhow, that covered, this date is wrong. It actually covered about 10 years worth of effort. 10 years of looking at one star after another. Not just using this antenna, we eventually went to the Green Bank 140 foot telescope in West Virginia, and also the Arecibo telescope down in Puerto Rico. We used all three of those antennas, a very sophisticated system, and one that could do something that Dan Wertheimer's spectrometers cannot do. The problem is if you look for more than a second, you might begin to dilute the signal because the signal is going to drift in frequency. It's going to drift in frequency because presumably ET is on a planet which is rotating and that rotation, this is just a little bit of high school geometry, that rotation induces a changing Doppler shift in the transmitted signal. And even if you don't have that problem, of course our own Earth is rotating and that also produces a changing Doppler shift. And what the system that was being used by the SETI Institute can do and still can do is find drifting signals, signals that are changing in frequency by as much as a hertz per second. Okay, so they can find signals that are coming from a rotating planet. By the way, this is a signal that we actually picked up down in Arecibo. You, you can see the signal here is fairly complex. This is the Pioneer 10 spacecraft. We would routinely look at the Pioneer uh, spacecraft, not because it's extraterrestrial intelligence, but because it was a great end-to-end -end test of the system. Right? If you have a big SETI system, a very complex piece of equipment, and you don't find any signals, that could mean two things. One, you still haven't tripped across ET, or two, the system doesn't work and you don't know it. So it's, it's, it's a good to, uh, to run these tests. Uh, I should mention that we don't limit ourselves to radio waves. Radio waves have the big advantage that they go right through the gas and dust between the stars, so they sound good. Uh, they're cheap to produce. I get emails just about every other day from people who are saying, why don't you look for gravitational waves? Why don't you look for neutrinos? There are a lot of other ways you might think of looking for ET, but you know, neutrinos are very expensive to produce. An individual neutrino carries a lot of energy, right? A high energy neutrino carries as much energy as a 45 caliber bullet or something like that. I mean, they're very expensive. And you only detect maybe one in a million of them with the best detectors we can make. Right? So that's a very expensive way to send bits of information from one star to the next. It has, it has a certain advantage with neutrinos because, as you know, there's like a trillion neutrinos going through your brain every second here. It's probably not influencing your personality terribly much. But the big advantage of neutrinos is they'll also go right through the Earth. Right? So you don't have to worry about pointing in the right direction. The, the signal will come to you even if you're on the wrong side of the planet. That's the advantage. The disadvantage is that it's enormously expensive in terms of energy per bit. Uh, but we do look for something other than radio. We look for light signals. This is a G-type star like the Earth, sorry, like the Sun, and uh, the Sun puts out on the order of 10 to the 26 watts, which means it's putting out on the order of that number of photons per second. Okay, and the reason I mention this is if you're gonna look for flashing lights in the sky and you're pointed at somebody else's star system, there is the problem that their star is going to be filling up your uh, detector with photons. Well, how many photons? Suppose you're 100 light years away from that star system. Uh, that's uh, 100 million photons per second if you have a one square meter mirror. Okay, but if you slice up time into nanosecond slices, if you have photomultiplier tubes at the back end of your telescope, then you can see events every, say, nanosecond. You can slice up the experiment into nanosecond slices. And in a nanosecond, of course, you get less than, you get fewer than one photon from the star. But if you take the world's biggest lasers, in your mind do this, take the world's biggest lasers, aim them into a mirror on the order of a meter across, and aim that mirror at something 100 light years away, and flash it for a nanosecond, it'll produce hundreds, even thousands of photons in a one square meter mirror 
at the other end of that 100 light years. In other words, 50 years after inventing the laser, we can already build lasers that can outshine the sun for, at, at a distance, say, of 100 light years or more, uh, for a nanosecond, for a nanosecond. So that might be a good way to get our attention, just to flash lights in our direction. So we have done some experiments at Lick Observatory and elsewhere. This is an undergraduate, Shelley Wright, or she was an undergraduate uh, when this photo was made. But this box here contains three photomultiplier tubes to avoid false positives. You have more than one. Uh, just attached to the back of a one meter telescope at Lick Observatory. And when we can get the grad students to open the dome and do the experiment, which is only occasionally, then in fact, we look for flashing lights. We look for bunches of photons coming from other star systems. I think this is a very good experiment to run. Anybody who works at a university that has a small telescope and can afford $10,000 worth of electronics can build this. And a completely unplumbed field. Right? Very little work has been done in this field. Uh, the other way to do SETI, of course, and is occasionally talked about at the IAC conferences, is to look for alien artifacts, alien technology, Dyson swarms, or other things that truly advanced societies may have built. It's a little unclear what we should look for, but this is a perfectly legitimate way to prove that somebody's out there. Okay, here's Frank Drake. He comes in every day, he writes this equation down on the board. We're not quite sure what it means, but the question that Frank gets all the time, and that all of us get all the time, is when are you going to succeed? It's been 50 years since Frank did the first experiment, and we still haven't found a signal, and 50 years is a long time to do an exploratory project. Right? I mean, even the great explorers of, of uh, the 16th and 17th century didn't spend 50 years getting anywhere. Right? That's a long time. And I would listen to Frank, and he would give some number of years until we would succeed. And then I would listen to people like uh, Jill Tarter and, and Dan Wertheimer and Peter Backus and other of my colleagues, and they would always answer the question with a certain number of years. And I plotted them up once, and I noticed that they correlated very well with the number of years until these people retired. <laughs> so it sounded like wishful thinking. So here's a suggestion as to what my, my answer to this is. First off, let me point out something. And that is the fact that we haven't succeeded so far is, to my mind, simply attributable to the fact that we have looked at very, very little cosmic real estate. This is some attempt by, I think it was Scientific American made this graphic, to graphically show what amount of phase space has actually been investigated looking for ET. And uh, you can quibble about all these numbers here and the fact that there should be more than three dimensions in the plot anyhow, which makes it difficult to, 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 to draw the diagram. But uh, the, the bottom line is still the same. Very little phase space has been looked at. The number of star systems that, been, that have been looked at carefully is 750. That was Project Phoenix. In a galaxy of a few hundred billion stars, obviously 750 is not very many. It's completely analogous to looking for megafauna in Africa sailing to maybe the west coast of Africa and looking at one city block of real estate. And saying, well, Bob, I don't see any very large creatures with, with, with long noses that can pick up peanuts. I guess there are no megafauna on this continent. And that would be a premature conclusion, of course, given the fact that you haven't looked at very much real estate. And the same is true for the study. And in fact, at the rate at which we've been doing our search, even if the galaxy has tens of thousands of societies that are broadcasting, uh, it will take millennia before we find them. And that doesn't sound so good. The funding might run out. So let me suggest that it's not that bad. I've already just made that point. This is the Allen Telescope Array. This is a joint project between the SETI Institute and the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, this is located up in Hat Creek, California, in the Cascade Mountains. Uh, this is a couple, you see a couple of the antennas here. They're six meters in diameter, so they're fairly small. They would fit in your backyard, although your neighbor might not like it. Uh, the idea is to build 350 of these. It's all being built with private money. It's called the Allen Telescope Array because Paul Allen, the co-founder of Microsoft, gave the money to get this started. And uh, it's an, an impressive instrument. Now, there are only 42 antennas at the moment, but if you got all 350, this would be an extremely interesting instrument just for conventional radio astronomy research. It also would be interesting for SETI because unlike what we've done in the past, it would be available 24-7 for doing the experiment. SETI has been, you know, trying to, it's been like doing cancer research, but always having to borrow the microscope, right? If you can build this thing, then in fact you get your own microscope. So. The, the difficulty here is only one of money. Uh, to, to finish this array, build all 350 antennas will take another maybe 30, 40 million dollars. 
And uh, if somebody in the audience is, you know, happens to have that, um, we'll be happy to, you know, honor you with some sort of free dinner or something. So it's a photo I made about six months ago, or a little longer than that, of uh, all 42 antennas. You can see here all the lava beds in this area. Now, this is the interesting plot. They say every time you show a graphic, you lose 10% of the audience. And uh, I have 12, so. This is, this is a, my attempt to sort of quantify how fast our search is and is becoming. So what you see here, these black dots give some metric of the speed of SETI searches since Frank Drake's beginning search in 1960. Okay, so you can see that the, you know, SETI's getting faster. And those of you who are still conscious may notice that this is a semi-logarithmic plot. In other words, it's getting faster exponentially. The line there, of course, is a fit to those data, but in fact, it's really not. It's just my drawing in my eye, something called Moore's Law. Uh, those of you who are engineers know what Moore's Law is. It's a, an economic law of the Silicon Valley that says every 18 months, the amount of processing power you can buy per dollar doubles. Now, you may think that's a technological law. It's actually, it's, it's an economic law because the people who make computers recognize that this is an expensive purchase and they want you to replace your computer on the same sort of time scale that you might replace your car. Now, in the case of your car, the manufacturers have the cooperation of, for example, the California Department of Highways, which is sure to throw salt on the roads up in the mountains to make sure that your car uh, you know, deteriorates. But in the case of your computer, you know, <laughs> you don't have that problem. And after five years, it looks just as good as the day you bought it, right? So they have to figure out some other way to make it obsolete. And the way they do that is they keep doubling the, the, the processing power every 18 months. So after three or four years, you know, when you tell people what sort of laptop or desktop computer you have at parties, you don't get any respect and you replace your computer. All right, well, SETI is mostly digital electronics and consequently it follows Moore's law. In other words, it's doubling in speed every 18 months on average. And uh, when I talk to people in the Silicon Valley who are in the business of producing processing power, uh, how much longer is this going to go? You know, they're not quite sure of that, but the best estimates are at least a decade or two decades and maybe more. Okay. So that gives you some idea of the speed of the searches. We're looking for a needle in a haystack, and this tells you how fast we're going to go through the hay. And this tells you how much hay we've looked at. That's this, this plot here just shows how far out into space you could look, assuming that you had this doubling of compute capability uh, every 18 months. And in fact, the interesting numbers are these, these arrows here. Those are estimates. That's really too good a word for this. Th these are guesses as to how many societies are out there broadcasting signals that are going through your bodies as you sit through this. Okay. Now we don't know. Carl Sagan figured there might be a million. And if he's right, then we're going to trip across ET in a couple of years. Isaac Asimov figured 670,000. He was smarter than these other guys, so he could do this to two decimal places. Uh, he figures 670,000 societies broadcasting right now, in which case it's going to take to 2020 or something. Frank Drake himself figures there are like 10,000 societies in the galaxy, which means that it will take until on the order of 2028 or something like that before we find ET. But the point is, the point is this. These numbers are all small. These numbers are decades at most. Okay? And you can say, yeah, yeah, but these are not based on any real science. These are based on guesses as to how many needles are in the haystack. And that's true. I mean, I've asked Frank, personally, I said, Frank, where'd you get this number, 10,000 broadcasting societies in the galaxy? And he said, well, I was driving in on Highway 17 this morning, and it seemed like a good number. Okay. So, in fact, but, but I have to say, Frank Drake's a very clever guy, and usually what he says is right. So maybe he's right about this. But my real point is slightly different. It's only that you can say, I don't believe any of those numbers, and that's perfectly legitimate. But these are the numbers that have motivated the entire SETI enterprise. So if SETI is a worthwhile endeavor, if it has a reason to be done the way it's being done, if we're not barking up the wrong tree, as it were, in doing SETI, then it's going to succeed soon. Right? Either it's going to succeed in a few dozen years, or there's something fundamentally wrong. 
Now, what could be wrong is that there really aren't any civilizations out there, or there just aren't very many of them, that 10,000 is wildly off. That could be. Right? Or it could be that we're missing some important physics, so we're just doing the wrong experiment altogether. That could also be. Right? I mean, there's, if there's physics that allows some other means of communication that is cheaper per bit than, say, radio, then this is the wrong experiment. Uh, but if the premise for SETI is justified, if you think, yes, this is worth trying, then it isn't correct to say that this is something that might happen in the next uh, you know, two generations from now or in the next century or something like that. If the premise of SETI is correct, then it's going to happen soon rather than later. Okay. Um, now, I'm just, uh, <laughs> you may have thought that this is all speculative, but it's not entirely. I'm going to sort of change gears here and talk a little bit about what ET might be like. And you might say, who cares? Many of my colleagues would say, who cares? I don't care. Little gray guys, little green guys, you know, little green men, big blue women. These have all been suggested. Uh, and they say, well, we don't care as long as they're able to build a radio transmitter, because that's what we're looking for. Right? In fact, the definition of intelligent being in the SETI arena is you can build a radio transmitter. Right? So I always encourage audiences to ask the person sitting next to them, can you build a radio transmitter? And you'll know how to judge them uh, for the rest of this conference. Now, the reason that I think it makes a difference about our perception of ET is this. This is uh, Percival Lowell in 1900. Percival Lowell graduated from Harvard with a degree in mathematics. He was interested in astronomy. Rather than taking tenure at a fourth-rate institution, hoping to get promoted, he had enough family money to simply build his own observatory, which he modestly named the Lowell Observatory. And here he is, back in 1900, you would put on a suit and a tie to sit alone all night in a dark dome looking at Mars. Lowell was a great proponent of the idea that there was this vast hydraulic civilization on Mars, the canals on Mars. And he was a very good writer. He wrote several books about this, justifying all this shovel-ready trench work that the Martians were doing. The reason this is important is that he was looking for extraterrestrial life using an 8-inch refra refracting telescope in Flagstaff, Arizona. Right? Uh, here's some of his work. But on the left, you see some of the maps made by Lowell of the canals. On the right, you see a more recent photo of Mars made by spacecraft of the same area. And you can see that it's all there except for the straight lines. Um, here's a picture from a, an astronomy textbook of the era showing what we would find on Mars. As it turns out, we didn't quite find that on Mars. This is a picture from 1908 showing the Martians at a cocktail party. You can... <laughs> You can, they're, they're rather anthropo, anthropomorphic, and you can tell the females because they have longer eyelashes and they wear ribbons. Um, the guy who figured out, by the way, what was going on here was a guy by the name of uh, Maunder. You know Maunder from the Maunder Minimum and so forth, but, uh, it, and his work on uh, understanding the Ice Ages. But this guy Maunder made uh, graphics like the one on the left, right? That it's a, sort of a pseudo-Mars. He just made these charcoal drawings, and he put them up in the front of a classroom in the, in the UK filled with 11-year-old boys. And he just had them draw what was being held up at the front of the, the class. And uh, the, 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 the kids in the front row would draw pretty much what you see there. The kids in the back row, of course, are farther away, and they tended to connect the dots. They put a lot of straight lines into the drawing. At a certain distance, they started putting in straight lines. And uh, Maunder explained the canals on Mars as this uh, effect that's caused by the way your retina is built and the way your brain is wired. You connect the dots. It obviously has survival value if you connect the dots in an image, a vague image you might catch dinner or might avoid being caught for dinner yourself. So edge recognition is clearly something of, of import for survival. But in any case, that's probably what was going on with, with Lowell. And as it turned out in the 1970s, of course, when the... the uh, Viking landers plopped down onto the surface of our little ruddy buddy up there. They didn't find those lovely canals. They found pictures like this. They sent these pictures back, which was, in a way, somewhat disappointing to a lot of people because they expected to see little green guys or at least some vegetation. And I think Norm Horowitz, who was part of the Viking biology team down at JPL at the time, said, well, don't get discouraged. It could be that there's life on Mars that looks like rocks. But in fact, it turns out these are rocks. Um, and now when we talk, we still talk about looking for life on Mars, of course, 
uh, there's evidence, this is just one example of the kind of evidence we have. Uh, this is, you know, this, this photo of a crater wall was made by one of the orbiting spacecraft six years after the one on the left, and you see something has happened in the meantime. It looks like liquid water has leached out of the side of the, uh, the crater wall and run down there. Uh, the, the bottom line here is that if you want to look for life on Mars today, and a lot of people do, the thing to do is to get a big space agency to send Bruce Willis and a bunch of roughnecks to Mars and have them drill down a couple of hundred feet and pull up the muck and look at it under a microscope. And you might find the Martians. Okay. So the point is that our concept of what extraterrestrial life might be like really has a profound effect on how we look for it. Right? In 1900, we figured we could find them with a small telescope in Arizona. Today, we have to send Bruce Willis to Mars. A lot more expensive. Okay, how we picture ET these days is, whoops, carbon-based. We always assume carbon-based. Doesn't really have to be carbon-based. But carbon, as you know, has those four covalent bonds. It likes to hook up with other atoms. It's a very friendly atom. It makes complex molecules. And despite what you think when you wake up in the morning, life is all about complex molecules. Uh, of course, you know, people in science fiction like to talk about the other elements below carbon in the periodic table, which also have these four bonds. Uh, silicon, for example, but silicon is, you know, it's a bigger atom. It doesn't make uh, such interesting molecules. They're not as stable and so forth and so on. Uh, but silicon-based life could be possible under certain circumstances. I don't know about germanium. Tin life, tin-based life seems only to have occurred in the, the Wizard of Oz, but I don't know. Uh, but we, we make assumptions that, you know, life is biological, uh, very similar to our own biology in some sense. Homo chorality is maybe a marker of life on a planet with plate tectonics and so forth and so on, smaller than a rat, bigger than 10, not bigger than 10 elephants, bigger than a rat. Uh, th these are just scaling laws, right? If you, if you take you know, any, any Earth terrestrial life form and you scale it up uh, enormously, you have problems with the scaling laws because the power to weight ratio goes down, they can't stand up and so forth and so on. These are all just s straightforward extrapolations of what we see here on Earth. If they're going to be intelligent, they have to be able to wield a soldering iron. This is probably rules out the dolphins. Stereo vision is good. Uh, these are all things we sort of implicitly assume. And so we tend to point our antennae and do our experiments looking for cousins of Earth or moons that are cousins of Earth. Right? We're looking for worlds that might have liquid oceans, that might have some sort of atmosphere and so forth. This is our preferred mode of searching. And this is so ingrained that, you know, you're sitting there thinking, well, yeah, of course, what's wrong with that? Well, there may not be anything wrong with it if you're looking for biology. However, it does assume they're somewhat like us. And they might not be. Let's consider our own future evolution. To begin with, we're going to start putting chips in our brains or other places, I suppose. Uh, you can get the entire internet easily into a grain of sand with three-dimensional memory technology. There is a problem with the interface between that and your brain. But I was just talking to some guy who works on that uh, just recently, a couple of weeks ago, and I said, how long is it going to be before we'll have some sort of way that we can engineer an ability to read out artificial memories so that, you know, uh, when you go to a party, you know everybody's name because it's all in that memory bank. Or, you know, you can look up uh, historic facts and then, you know, press members of the opposite sex and so forth. And, you know, I, I was surprised by this guy's answer. He said, we'll be able to do that within 10 years. Well, he's probably wrong, but if he's, you know, if he's only wrong by an order of magnitude, it's still going to happen pretty soon. Okay? So we're going to do all that, but, but I don't think that's really what's interesting. I think what's really interesting is not the cybernetic enhancements, but it's the fact that if you develop thinking machines as opposed to cybernetic enhancements for us, then you've done something truly different. And I've made this little graphic just to show what I mean here, because the point is the speed of improvement. On the left, you have Chucky e. Darwin's idea. So here's a horse 60 million years ago. Horses 60 million years ago were about the size of a collie dog. Today, horses are roughly the size of a horse. Now that's, that's what's happened in 60 million years, right? <laughs> Progress, but slow, and not necessarily in that direction. Other things have gotten smaller. Now on the right, you have some personal computers. I had a personal computer in 1977. It had a one megahertz clock speed 8-bit bus. The thing I have at home today is, I don't know, a couple of gig, uh, gigahertz clock speed, and it has, a, I think, a 32-bit bus. In other words, it's somewhere between five and 10,000 times better than what I had in 1977. In other words, in 35 years, it's gotten thousands of times better. 
That's 35 years. On the left, you have Darwin. Okay? So it should be obvious to you that if you can invent thinking machines, then they evolve very quickly. Not only because of the, the, the fact that they, you know, they got something like Moore's Law, but also because they're not stuck with Darwinian evolution, which is kind of you know, a random walk. They can have Lamarckian evolution. If you're a machine and you want more memory, you just go down to Radio Shack, buy it, put it in. Right? If you want more memory, there's not much you can do about it. We can send away for these correspondence courses, but they don't really work. At least I don't recall that they work. So, that's really my point. There's another point to this. If you have thinking machines, of course, they have all sorts of advantages that, uh, that in most cases, trump what you can do with biology. Now, the real argument here is a time scale argument. It's a time scale. There may be some among you who think that we'll never build a thinking machine. But I think, I, I believe now you're, you're really in a decided minority. The people in the AI community have been saying they're going to make a true thinking machine within 10 years. They've been saying that for at least 30 years that I know of, okay? But, while that sounds bad, the rejoinder to pointing out that fact is for them to say, look, don't confuse lack of success with lack of progress. Right? Because they are making progress. Now let's say they don't do it in the next 10 years. They don't do it in the next 20 years. Suppose it takes until the end of the century. Or even the end of the next century. It doesn't matter. The point is you invent radio so you can go on the air and we can find you with a SETI experiment. And then within a century or two or three, you invent your successor. Right? That's a very short period of time. And that's why I think you can forget figuring that E.T. is going to be some sort of biological entity, some little gray guy with big eyeballs or some guy like this, this fellow who's had surgery on his nose. It's some sort of, you know, member of a species with billions of uh, individuals and so forth and so on, take me to your leader kind of guys. They'll be machines. And so if you're going to say that, well, how do, so what? If they're machines, I mean, that might make it a little different if you actually pick up a signal because if you can ever understand that signal it might be coming from some sort of synthetic sentience as opposed to some soft squishy alien but does that affect your SETI experiments and clearly it should affect your SETI experiments because the SETI experiments are largely directed toward looking at habitats that might be like our own because we're expecting biology well what would the thinking machine want I mean maybe they'd hang around on their native planet but probably not I mean, I can imagine the machines get up and just leave, at least some of them, because this is not where the action is, right? And when you say, well, what, what do you mean by where the action is? Well, I ask you, I ask you to think of what is important in life, and you're all sitting there thinking sex and money, but it's actually matter and energy, which on Earth we turn into sex and money. Okay, <laughs> so, so they need some energy, they need some material. Beyond that, I'm not sure what they need. I find it thoroughly impossible to figure out what a, a thinking machine with an IQ that's, you know, 20 orders of magnitude beyond mine, it, it finds interesting. I mean, I, that's, there's, a, there's a short story by Stanislav Lem, in fact, called Golem, was it Golem 14 or something? And uh, in fact, the military develops a thinking machine which immediately produces another generation of thinking machines. They're doing it for their own purposes. And the first generation of really thinking machines does listen to the people that build it and tries to work on the problems they find interesting. The second generation, however, does not. It's no longer interested in your problems. They've got their own problems. And it's very unclear from the story or anybody else exactly what those problems are. But let's say that they do want energy and matter no matter what. Well, that would give us an incentive to look at places where the universe has a high concentration of matter and energy. For example, O stars. We never look at O stars in our SETI experiments. O stars, for those of you who are not astronomers, are very uh, big, hot stars. They put out, as you see here, tens of thousands of times as much energy as the sun, right? And the reason they're never looked at for SETI purposes is because, you know, they're going through their fuel very quickly. They're bigger. They have more fuel, but they've got a, you know, 16-cylinder engine, so they go through the tank of gas fast. They burn out in 10 million to 50 million years. Right, so we figure, all right, forget it. No, no ET around a star like that because the star isn't alive long enough to survive or, or rather to promote uh, the development of life on any planets around it that evolves to intelligence. But on the other hand, if you're a machine, this may be just the kind of place you want to go to. Look, one thing I need, more energy. 
Here's a suggestion for another kind of astronomical object that might be worth pointing our antennae at, uh, Bach globules, so-called Bach globules. These are just small dark clouds of, of gas and dust. So you have a lot of gas and dust. I mean, you know, tens of thousands of atoms per cc, which is, you know, a lot in the interstellar medium. So a lot of material, some very hot stars that have been born there. A lot of matter and energy. Uh, here's another Bach globule. What would the machines be like? No idea. Uh, Ray Kurzweil said at the SETI Institute about uh, six months ago, he said, you know what they're going to be like? They're going to be these nanobots. These nanobots are going to swarm throughout the universe and chew up everything. I'm not sure they're going to be nanobots. And, and by the way, there isn't a whole lot of evidence that they've been swarming through the universe, chewing up everything. Although, who's to say what we're missing? The reason I don't think that this is such a likely idea is because if you have a swarm, then you have you know, light travel time between the individual members of the swarm. And you can't be quite as clever as if you concentrate everything into one big piece. This was uh, Ray's idea. So, you know, if you see a swarm of these things coming this way, probably the best thing to do is buy some frozen pizza, uh, grab your wife or girlfriend and head for the hills because it's going to be all over. I think that this is a more likely scenario where you just have uh, a lot of computing power in as small and uh, volume as possible made out of this hypothetical material, computronium, which is the highest uh, density computing material there is, whatever that is. Uh, what can you say about it? I don't know what you can say about it other than what I've already said, matter and energy. The other thing is, and I've, I've ventured this uh, in, in a uh, paper, uh, I do think that you might have a winner-take-all situation here. In other words, that one machine will dominate a very large region of space, maybe hundreds of light years around or at least tens of light years around, simply because the evolution of machines is so enormously faster than biology that whatever machine gets started first has such a lead that nothing can ever catch up to it. Okay, so there may be you know, dominant machines here. And yeah, I'm not going to go into the sociology of, uh, of thinking machines because the data set is very sparse, but I suggest to you that you might want to think about it. Maybe they'd go to black holes. There's a lot of available energy there, as Roger Penrose has shown. Uh, you just throw your garbage around the black hole and you get out of a lot of energy. And the final thought is where you might look in our own galaxy where the best place is perhaps for truly advanced sentience that is interested in high concentrations of matter and energy and that would be what you see in this infrared photo of our galaxy, the galactic center there where the amount of material per cubic inch is about a million times what it is here and there's a big black hole which you could use as a source of energy. So that may be uh, our destiny to uh, eventually end up there as some sort of machine. My intention in this talk was simply to give you a little bit of a background on SETI where it's been to point out to you that unlike the popular perception of this field, it's not a static endeavor at all. Most people have the idea that we're sitting around with earphones as Jody Foster did waiting for ET's call. Obviously we got rid of the earphones a long time ago for various reasons. To begin with, they're very uncomfortable. And if you have several hundred million channels you're monitoring all the time, then you have to wear so many earphones. It's really uncomfortable. But beyond that, it's extremely boring. Uh, so that's all been taken over by computers. But my point is not so much the automization of SETI, but simply the fact that SETI is increasing its speed in an exponential way. And consequently, I stress again to you, and I will bet you all a cup of coffee, as I do all audiences, I will bet you a cup of Starbucks that we will find ET in the next two dozen years. So here's the deal for you. Either you come to an IAC two dozen years from now, and you can hear stories, you can hear papers about how we've finally proven that we're not the smartest things in the galaxy, or you get a cup of coffee. Okay, thank you very much. I know uh, many of you are going on this planetarium. Is it the planetarium trip? In any case, there are buses loading for that at 7.30, so feel free to leave. If anybody has some questions, I'd be happy to take a couple of questions. Yes, sir. Are we transmitting any signals so that they can hear us? Are we transmitting any signals so that they can hear us? Many of you are aware of the fact that Stephen Hawking has recently opined that this is not a good idea because you don't know what they might be like and we shouldn't betray our existence because it might lead to havoc and destruction. Uh, there have been some deliberate broadcasts. There continue to be some deliberate broadcasts. They've been very intermittent, very targeted. But what has happened for 70 years now is that FM, television, and radar signals have leaked off the Earth. And while those are not easy to find, not with the kind of equipment we have, any society that would have the capability of being a threat to you 
uh, could pick up those signals. So if you're going to worry about, for example, <laughs> broadcasting into space, it's too late. That horse has left the barn. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. Yes, the gentleman refers to some stories that were written by Jonathan Leakey of a, one of the British press members about somebody who's at this conference, actually. Masman Offman was here. She's from Malaysia originally, but she's working in Europe now for the United Nations. And uh, uh, according to what Masman told me, this is a misunderstanding. Uh, but she, the story was that if ET gets in touch, the first person they're going to talk to is Masman at the United Nations. Actually, uh, I, I, I think such thoughts as who are they going to talk to first, to begin with, our, signal, our responses are already out there. So maybe they're going to talk to I Love Lucy first. But in any case, or at least that's the first message they're going to get is going to be you know, some of those early broadcasts. There's that. But on the other hand, I also don't think that it matters too much who represents Earth. And I'm sure I'll get some pushback on this statement here from the uh, anthropologists in the audience. But I uh, think of historical examples when Captain Cook meant the, the residents of uh, Fiji. It really didn't matter who spoke first or what they said. Okay, thank you very much.